Next, tragedy strikes, accidents happen. Be there when the calls come in. It's back-to-back -back episodes of Rescue 911. Next on Discovery Health Channel. Today on Rescue 911. Then, a boat race turns deadly. The five point harness wouldn't release. Dive in with the rescue team. We've been underwater at least two to three minutes without oxygen. On Rescue 911. <laughs> Professional outboard racing is one of the fastest growing spectator sports in the United States. Most of the footage in this story was taped at racing events around the country. IOGP, it's the professional end of the boat racing. Most guys are coming from all over the world and they run for prize money and it's a lot of fun. It's also a very dangerous sport with competitors pushing their power boats to speeds of more than 100 miles an hour. Back in the early days when we first started, drivers were thrown out of their boat and we had the possibility of them getting run over by their own boat or getting run over by other boats. Being thrown out of a boat at 110 miles an hour and hitting the water is like hitting a concrete wall. And there's no giving in the water. Tougher safety measures, including a four-point harness and reinforced driver's capsule, allow most racers to emerge from high-speed crashes without injury. Ho, ho, ho! And that was number 57, Mark But when a racer does need help, the Star Rescue Team is on the scene within seconds. There has been a lot of drivers that have refused to race if we're not there. You know, one of the problems is they've got to where they have so much trust in us sometimes that they might push a little too hard. The stars include firefighters, paramedics, and divers, all volunteers who travel around the country providing emergency services at racing events. On August 12, 1989, Chuck Walker was scheduled to compete in St. Louis, assisted by his friend, Charlie Ivora. I drove the van and the boat up to St. Louis, and Chuck flew up that weekend. Chuck's wife was not at the races that day. We were all real excited for him. And I went to all the races, and he's always done good. But this race, both of us weren't able to go. You know, I was really scared not to go because I was afraid something could happen if we didn't go. Charlie helped Chuck make his final preparations. It was his first IRGP race, and he was a little worried about that. But he's very competitive, and he only knows one speed, and that's all out. You know, he won't back out of it. You don't want nobody to pass him. The race was getting ready to start, and the official comes around. We go through a, a visual inspection, safety harnesses, setting Chuck in the boat, strapping him in, make sure everything's all right before we get it out on the water. What? The race was a qualifying heat for the 1989 World Championship Grand Prix. Twenty seconds, and the flag is up. They're under starter's orders. Jeff Titus, official starter, IOGP, and down goes the flag. And number 37, Chuck Walker, Boca Raton, Florida. He gets a late start away from the dock. Chuck had to start a few seconds after everybody else left, but as soon as he took off from the dock, he passed about five boats. He looked real good. He was running real strong. The boat was running real good. One of the star rescue divers that day was Buddy Kamen. We had four rescue craft on the course. I was on turn four and started out to be a real good day. Chuck didn't get a real good start, but he was coming on around. And Meyer goes to the inside, and that puts number 50. Glenn Reynolds up in second place. And oh, we got one over down here. That was the late starting number 37, Chuck Walker. The accident looked like a training accident almost. It was so slow. At that point, I thought, before I can enter the water, 
he'll be out of the boat. Anytime we have an accident, we stop the race immediately. And then we have the closest boat to the accident respond in. And all the boats have come to a stop. The red flags are out. Friday, a murder investigation that doesn't add up. I told my investigator, go back to that crime scene and make sure we have her story correct. Then, when physical evidence is washed away by nature... It gets to the point where under the microscope you can hardly even tell what's what. Dr. G moves this case to the decomp room. Not a bad odor at all. Dr. G, medical examiner. Friday at 9 on Discovery Health Channel. Rescue 911 continues next on Discovery Health Channel. My craft responded. I was in the water in approximately 15 seconds from the time the accident happened. I went down the first time, and Chuck Walker was conscious at this time. He took his helmet off, and he grabbed my hand and put it on his harness. He was thrashing about. He struck my regulator. I could not take any air from it. Buddy's regulator was broken. Neither one could use it. Another diver, two divers go into the water. By the time the second diver got to the driver's capsule with his air supply, Chuck was unconscious. After 30 to 45 seconds, I was getting real concerned because they should have had him out by then, you know, or he should have been able to get out by himself by then. As the crowd watched, divers, including Clay Ingle, struggled to release Chuck's harness. As I entered the water, I knew they had a problem out of the ordinary, and so I was already prepared for the worst. You could tell he was unconscious. His eyes were slightly open, and he wasn't breathing. As soon as I realized that we couldn't get the belts undone underwater, I immediately went back up and hollered for somebody to hand me the seatbelt cutters. It was a bad situation. Tensions were up. We still wasn't sure on the extent of his physical injuries. So the quicker I can get them out, the better. Or they'll start the drowning process. Could happen right in front of the crowd and right in front of the judge's stand. And I remember during the rescue not hearing anything. It just seemed like it was deathly quiet. It was taking too long to cut Chuck out of the jammed harness. When I saw him like that, instantly a timer went off in my mind. OK, time is a factor. You know, let's do what we have to do. It's hard to get him out upside down because buoyancy and everything will keep him pushed up in there. Above the water, they were trying to flip the 1,400-pound boat. We need to hurry up and get this boat turned over, or this guy's going to die. And you know, when you got a life in balance like that, minutes seem like hours. We rolled the boat over. Clay was still with him at that time, cutting the safety harness out. At that point, he was non-breathing. I started artificial respiration on him. I thought he was dead when they pulled him out. His eyes were rolled back in his head. He was purple as can be, and he wasn't moving. Paramedic Randy Sammons coordinated from the shore. We felt we had something pretty bad because we'd been underwater at least two to three minutes without oxygen, so we were preparing for the worst. They came to shore, patient was cyanotic and was having a full-blown seizure.
His seizures was full body, arms and legs, just thrashing around uncontrollably. Well, seizures can be caused by many things. This particular instance, I feel it was due to the anoxia, which is the lack of oxygen, which he had because he was underwater for that length of time. They began treating him with oxygen immediately. I knew we had a pretty good chance to revive him, even though he'd been under the water that long. I thought I was going to have to come back and tell his wife that he was dead. But I got a little relief when I seen the doctor stick, stick her head out and give me a thumbs up. By the time the ambulance left the scene, Chuck was breathing normally. He was taken to St. Anthony's Hospital for further treatment. When I went up there Sunday, he wanted out so bad, you know, the doctor wouldn't release him. He was getting ready to pull the IV out because the race was getting ready to start. He wanted to go to races. By the next day, Chuck Walker returned to the races as a spectator. I relayed the information to all the rescue crafts and even the pickup boats, and it just seemed like a whole air of newness came over them that Chuck was there. Five months later, the accident is still a vivid memory for Chuck and his family. I was in no fear whatsoever when the boat flipped. I remember it going over just as plain as day. I kept saying to myself, I said, those stars are going to be here. Those stars are going to be here. They're going to get me. I think if this star rescue team wasn't there, Chuck would have been dead. I think they're the greatest. And I welcome them in my home any time. They're just a great, great bunch of guys. I'm not going to say the boat will never flip over again, because if it ain't going to flip over, you're not driving it hard enough. You know, I kind of had a bad experience, but I feel like I'll be back next year. I'll be ready to do it to them. You know, 100% ready. I like him racing, but when he's in a really bad accident, I really don't want him to race again, because I see he's the best daddy in the whole wide world. Next, step inside the command center where the calls for help are answered and meet the real-life heroes who save lives. Stay tuned for another episode of Rescue 911. Next on Discovery Health Channel. Real life. Medicine. Miracles. Mr. Shapiro, step out of the car, please.